I'll dream it. Be it. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime, Crew Trime, Crew Trime. Crew Trime. If you're new here, hi. Welcome. How'd you find me? My name is Sarah, and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like a fun combination to you, you are in the right place. So make sure you subscribe to this channel, hit the bell notification, all that good fun stuff, and then you will never miss one of my terrible stories. So in the month of October, I've been focusing on spooky themes, you know, spooky, dark, supernatural. But today's story is a good old fashioned crime. It's, it's real bad, it's real bad. And it actually took place on Halloween. So let's get started. All right, bangs. Oh, also one other thing, I don't really show the makeup or talk about the products that I'm using as I'm telling the story. So if you're interested to know what I'm using, look down in the description box, everything that is available still will be linked. You know, I haven't really been buying any makeup at all. I've just been using what I have. So a lot of this stuff is real old. <laughs> On Halloween, October 31st, 2012, 55-year-old pastor John Douglas White helped his fiance's three-year-old grandson, Conway, get into his Halloween costume. He then drove the young trick-or-treater to a nearby grocery store parking lot and handed him off to his father. This was in Broomfield Township, Michigan, for a day of candy and Halloween fun. Broomfield Township is in Isabella County, which is pretty close to the center of the mitten, <laughs> northeast of Grand Rapids. Okay, so John White was the pastor of the Christ Community Fellowship Church in nearby Mount Pleasant, Michigan. He lived alone in a trailer park in Broomfield Township and was engaged to one of his parishioners, a woman named Sally Gay. Sally's 24-year-old daughter, Rebecca, was also a neighbor. She lived in the same trailer park as John, and he would sometimes babysit her young son, Conway, when Rebecca was at work. Isn't that nice? So John had moved to the area about five years before this, and he had a shady past. He made some mistakes in his life, you know, but he had found God and turned his life around. He found purpose and leading a congregation and having this relationship with Sally, living a godly life. I know, Murray. Well, what kind of shady past, you might ask? Really going for it today. I know I just said that I don't talk about the makeup, but I did actually come up with a plan for my makeup today. So let's see if it works. <laughs> I have no idea if it's gonna work. Okay, John's shady past. So when John was a young man, he served in the United States Navy and then he later became a long haul trucker. He was married with children and he was living in Battle Creek, Michigan. And that's about two hours south of Mount Pleasant, Broomfield area where this took place. Well, about 30 years before this event on Halloween, the 22 year old John attacked his 17 year old neighbor, Teresa Etherton. He stabbed her 15 times and strangled her. What? Yeah, apparently he invited her over to look at something in his garage, uh, basement, basement. While she was down there, he pounced and just, just fully attacked her brutally. Incredibly, Teresa survived. She reported the attack to the police and in an interview with Teresa years later, she recalled that John said during the attack, this isn't my first time, just shut up. You're making this more difficult than it needs to be. Oh, hell no. What? What? Also, if that's not enough, as young Teresa was like bleeding out in this guy's basement, he said to her, I'm really sorry you had to go like this, but what the fuck? You're just a woman. Fuck, fuck this, guy. this guy. Coming out swinging today, folks. <laughs> also, at one point during this attack, John's wife walked in and saw this terrible scene in the basement. What did she do, you might ask? Draped a sheet over Teresa's head and said, shut up, shut up, and just walked away. What is happening? Anyways, there had been another woman in the house, some visitor who heard Teresa's screams and called for help. John was sent to prison for 10 years for this, but about two years into this sentence, 
He filed an appeal about his legal representation failing to pursue the insanity defense. He won the appeal, the verdict was overturned, and then John was released with two years probation. Also was told to seek mental counseling, psychological counseling. That's just, that's just great. Great. By the way, Teresa wasn't told when he was released. That wasn't a thing that was required at that time. She was standing in line at the Michigan Secretary of State office, which is where you get your driver's license in Michigan. Well, she's standing there in line and she heard a familiar voice that she recognized. She turned around to see who it was and it was John White smiling at her. Instantly, I was like, yeah, no. Also, if that's not enough for you, about 10 years after he got out of prison for that, he killed a woman. The very married John was having an affair with a 26-year-old woman named Vicki Sue Wall. They had met at work. Vicki had gone missing, had last been seen on security camera footage getting into John's truck in the wee hours of the night of July 11th, 1994. Yes, Murray. Do you hear him? What was I talking about? All right, so Vicki Sue has disappeared. Interesting little nugget. John checked himself into the Kalamazoo Regional Psychiatric Hospital shortly after that. John was questioned by police, and although they were definitely squinting at him, his story kept changing. He also told them at that time that he has blackout spells, so he couldn't be sure that he didn't do anything to hurt Vicky Sue. Are those even? <laughs> <laughs> the shitty thing here is that without any real evidence to charge John with a crime, they had to let him go. Now this was the early 90s, right? So DNA testing and all that wasn't very sophisticated. Luminol, we all know, is like a reactant, right? You spray it in an area and it will light up like a glow if blood is detected. So Luminol testing was conducted um, in John's truck and it did light up, but they couldn't prove who the blood belonged to. I mean, dude, if you're gonna do luminol testing and then also find blood, but then who it belongs to becomes important, like, wh why even bother, man? Six weeks later, Vicky's mostly nude and badly decomposed body was discovered when a man who was out walking noticed um, a, like a drag mark trail in the tall grass near the road. So when he followed the little trail, the next thing he saw was a white sneaker and then a pair of underwears. And then it hit him, the stench of death, when he noticed what appeared to be a human skull. Oh, hell no! He alerted authorities, obviously. Well, it was Vicky's body, as we mentioned, and the condition of it was so bad that the medical examiner couldn't determine the cause of her death. Although, you know, there was a t-shirt and a bra wrapped around her neck. Once Vicky's body was discovered, John White stopped cooperating with law enforcement. But, get this, John actually pled guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Well, we know that investigators had wrangled up a bunch of blood in his vehicle, but you know, not much else. But old John must have been really scared of how it was gonna play out for him, especially based on his past, right? So he took the deal that sent him to prison for 15 years. He said at the sentencing phase of the trial that her death was a tragic accident and he loved her very much. Stop it. Gag. I'm getting like panda vibes. Yeah. <laughs> trust the process, trust the process. Anyway, by the way, when John was in prison, he told a prison psychologist or psychiatrist, he said he was having violent fantasies about murdering women, especially the female attorneys and uh, doing their dead bodies. You know what I mean. So after serving about 12 years of that sentence, his wife and children had ditched him by this point. He was released from prison on February 11th, 2007. Gosh, my face is just not symmetrical. <laughs> so John decided that he was a reformed man and had been forgiven of all of his sins by God. Isn't that nice? He moved to Mount Pleasant, Michigan and got busy at the Christ Community Fellowship Church. He was elected to be their pastor and some of the members of the congregation, very small congregation, it was like 12 people or something like that. Well, they knew about his past, but they believed in the power of redemption in 
forgiveness. Presumably, Sally Gay, his fiance, didn't really have the full picture of what his past was. And you know what? I don't, I don't know that the rest of the congregation really did either, but we'll get back to that. So over the next five years, John was busy. You know, he was doing church stuff, helping out with the neighbors and the members of the congregation, and also creeping on his fiance's daughter and neighbor, Rebecca. So let's go back to where we started. So in the early, early, like wee morning hours, like 2 a.m. on Halloween 2012, John White was drunk. He had been drinking Natty Daddies all day. The tall boys, you know what I mean? Oh yeah. That's the old dirty couch in the basement smell right there. And he had had at this point about four or five, so that's a lot. Well, John had been heavily fantasizing about Rebecca for weeks at this point. And when I say fantasizing about Rebecca, I mean he wanted to kill her and then do the sex to her dead body. <laughs> I mean, we know what that means. 24-year-old Rebecca Gay graduated from Bullock Creek High School in 2007. She was a very kind-hearted girl. She was always ready to lend a helping hand. Also, she was stunningly beautiful. She studied cosmetology and she even worked for a time at a local salon in Bloomfield for a short time. She was working as a cashier at a local Goodwill store and had even recently been promoted to head cashier. The Goodwill, if you're not familiar, it's like a, it's like a thrift store. Rebecca was known to her closest friends and family as Becca Boo. She was a devoted mother to her three-year-old son, Conway, and things with her boyfriend, Aaron Quinn, were going so well, he had recently bought her a ring, like a diamond ring, like the ring. Maybe was even planning to propose to her that night. Well, all blitzed out on Natty Light, John's fantasies of defiling Rebecca took over, and he grabbed a large rubber mallet and zip ties like the big one, the big ones. And he went over to her trailer. So some reports say that Rebecca was asleep in her bed and then some say that um, John saw her bedroom light on or something. So either way, John went to the side door of the trailer that he knew was gonna be open. Ooh, this is definitely giving don't dream it, be it vibes. Just the same. Don't dream it. Be it. So John went to the side door that he knew was gonna be unlocked and he let himself in. So when Rebecca either came out of the bedroom or maybe John got into the bedroom, either way, he attacked her, hitting her in the head over and over with that rubber mallet until she lost consciousness. When John noticed that Rebecca was still breathing, he took that zip tie and tightened it around her neck until she suffocated. He then dragged her lifeless body into the kitchen and removed her clothes and touched her. Then nasty John went home to get some more supplies, I guess, and then he returned to clean up. He bagged up the mallet and the bloodied towels and things and put them in the back of his truck along with Rebecca's nude body and then he dumped the bags on Woodruff Road and then dumped Rebecca's body in a ditch about a mile away. One mile away. After that, John went back to Rebecca's home, took her car out to a local watering hole, like a bar called the Barn Door. His intent was to make it look like she had been abducted, right? The bar, by the way, the Barn Door, was within eyesight of Rebecca's trailer. He then took her phone, her cell phone and keys and tossed them in a dumpster in the trailer park. Talk about doing like the absolute least to cover your tracks. I mean, shit. As you may have guessed, Rebecca's son, Conway, was at home the whole time. He was asleep in his bed. So once John was finished shittily covering his tracks, he got Conway ready for the day. You know, he helped him into his little Halloween costume and then he drove out to the regular handoff location with um, Conway's dad, which by the way, was not unusual. You know, he would sometimes do that to help out. So there wasn't really any suspicion in that handoff. Some suspicion did arise later. So when Rebecca did not show up for her shift at work, her coworkers were immediately alarmed. You know, she was never late. So her manager drove out to her trailer home and to check on her. The door was locked, nobody answered, but 
he did find her car parked at the barn door. It was positioned like weirdly, you know, sort of like under a tree or near a tree in the back of the lot. It was all just very strange. Also, when the staff members at the barn door were questioned if they'd seen her, none of them had, obviously, because she wasn't there. Obviously, by this time, they've called the police, and Rebecca was officially reported missing by noon that day. Reports hit the news and social media, and, you know, they were just begging anyone if they had seen her or talked to her in the last 24 hours to contact the county sheriff. So officially missing, investigators quickly initiated search warrants for Rebecca's home and car. And while they waited, Rebecca missed the pickup time for Conway. That's when they really knew something was really wrong. So once investigators were permitted to get inside the home to take a look around, they saw signs of struggle and stains on the carpet. They also found her purse on the kitchen counter. I mean, that's weird, right? I mean. Murray, what? Buddy, come here, baby. Crack. You want greenies? Come here. Jump up. Come get it. I need you guys to listen to Murray eat these greenies. Here, baby. Want me some? Oh, people are going to love this. Say hi to the peoples. Murray. Oh, I'm all c <laughs> covered in hair. Cat hair all over this microphone now. There's actually a very excellent episode of, uh, it's on Oxygen. I forget the name of it, but it covers this case and they interview her family members and they just get really detailed about little things that really tip them off anyways. So as I mentioned, they did find Rebecca's purse, which was very unusual. They also found her keys and phone in that trailer park dumpster. Pastor John White. He called church members and tearfully pled for them to start a prayer chain for Rebecca. Give me a break. Rebecca's mother, Sally, later said that John had been talking a lot recently about how beautiful her daughter was and he even made her dinner the night before the murder. So John was actually identified pretty early on as a person of interest in this case because he was Rebecca's neighbor and the fiance of her mother and Conway's father that morning reported that he was the one who had dropped him off. So police took him in for questioning. So by this time, just hours into Rebecca's disappearance, they had already found blood in her home and in John's home. They obviously knew about his dark past and criminal history. And by the way, they noticed that John had some scratches on his face. Hmm. That's suspicious. That's weird. Knowing that Rebecca's body could be out in the cold, wet Michigan weather. They pled with John to come clean, you know, don't let her rot outside in the woods. Well, backed into a corner, John confessed. He admitted to police that he had in fact killed Rebecca Gay, and then he gave them the exact location of her corpse. So he told investigators that he had been influenced by pornography, particularly pornographic videos that featured women being abused and murdered and necrophilia scenarios. Where do you find such things? I don't want to know. Don't tell me. I don't want to know this fantasy around Rebecca for like the last two weeks. According to court documents, John told them that he doesn't remember if he raped her dead body. Doesn't remember. People don't forget. So I found statements online from people that were close to Rebecca that say the coroner's report proves that she was sexually assaulted multiple times after she died. When John White confessed to this terrible thing, he seemed to be mostly concerned of the impact to his church members. One of the members of the congregation, church elder Donna Houghton, told local news that they were stunned to learn what Pastor John had done. It was her understanding, based on what Pastor John told them, that he had walked away from a woman who had overdosed, speaking to his criminal record of being responsible for someone's death. Sure, Jan. Well, I'm sure they justified that as some kind of evil sinner that got what they deserved. 
But anyways, Donna said, I protested his innocence until I had the absolute news that he confessed. All kinds of people turn around and meet the Lord and they're a different person and he was doing a lot of good in the community. He was doing a lot of good and Satan did not want him doing good and Satan got to him. Right, right, definitely, definitely Satan got it. You know what, hang on, let's unpack that. Satan got him. When? Now or when he confessed to murdering Vicki Sue Wall or when he tried to murder Teresa Etherton or when he lied to the congregation about his past or when he got really into necrophilia porn? <laughs> Just trying to keep up. Does that look orange to you? Yes. Well, the next day on November 1st, 2012, John White was arraigned in Isabella County Court on charges of first degree murder in the death of Rebecca Gay. On March 27th, 2013, John Douglas White entered a plea agreement. He pled guilty to second degree murder in the killing of Rebecca Gay, and Sally Gay testified at the sentencing phase. For 20 excruciating hours, we prayed that Rebecca would come home. She was not your Yours to take, how dare you? This needs to be a little more pumpkin-y, a little browner. She also said that John White was not the man he claimed to be, certainly not the person that she was in a relationship with, and asked the court to show him the same lack of mercy that he gave to her daughter. Isabella County Chief Circuit Judge Paul Chamberlain sentenced John White to 50 to 80 years in prison, essentially the rest of his natural life. But on August 28th, 2013, just four months into his sentence at the Michigan Reformatory in Ionia, Michigan, creepy ass John Douglas White was found dead in his prison cell having hanged himself. Good riddance. And that is the story of John Douglas White. All right, I'm going with like a orange, black and orange fantasy. You could even, you could put a little cat nose and some whiskers on this. Ooh, that'd be really cute. I have one more spooky story coming in the month of October, so hold on to your butts. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then subscribe to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week, and you can follow me on the other socials as well. I hope you guys are all having a lovely spooky season. Spoopy season. Shit. Suspicion. And I'll catch you next time in the next video. Bye! 12, 2012, fuck. I am thirsty. Ooh, that does not look good. I did it. <laughs> what am I doing? What am I doing? 2014, wow, what a beaut.